John Cool. Anybody in this room not hear John? <laughs> Anybody in this room not hear John ever talk? Okay, because he is absolutely, if not our favorite, one of our top favorite speakers, and we've already signed John up for two Civil War lectures next year. Uh, I'm not going to tell you our theme, but it's not the Civil War. But John is going to be doing two Civil War lectures for us next year, um, which is, you know, he is a statewide recognized expert on um, aspects of the Civil War across New Jersey, and certainly recognized as the expert of the Civil War in Hunter County. Um, John served decades on Cultural and Heritage Commission and decades as a trustee, where he still serves um, with the Historic Society. Uh, he still is reading newspapers. Um, John has been reading every single county newspaper for how many years now? Too many. And clipping them all. <laughs> yeah, he would. And clipping them all. So if you ever need something at the Historic Society, if you're looking for an old article, guaranteed if, when you find it, it's John's hands clipped that article. Um, so he continues to persist through 100 in history, um, and we just appreciate him so much. His knowledge of Three Bridges, his knowledge of the Civil War, his knowledge of the stuff that the Historic Society has been collecting. So uh, we look forward to this talk, and go for it, John. I'd talk a lot better with a couple of martinis, but... Oh, we had this morning. No, that's just coffee. That's my other advice. Uh, the intent of this series of lectures was to acquaint you, uh, the public, with some of the things in our collection. Now, we have probably, uh, without doubt, the finest manuscript collection of any county society in the, in the state. And that's our main claim to fame. But upstairs, on the second floor of the archives, is our attic. And these are some of the things out of the attic. And to me, they're far more interesting than some dry piece of paper. But of course, our archivists would disagree. <laughs> but uh, I hope we have time for everything. Uh, if not, you can look up just about everything on, I, I clipped, I clipped for 18,000 more, 18,000 clippings, and they're all online uh, with an index in the society, and the original clippings are there in a big filing cabinet. So. You want to look up, say, West Borland, you go West Borland, there's the whole story of these rocks and so on. So we probably won't have time to cover everything, but we'll do our best. One of my favorite items is this. Does anybody know what this is? Anybody in the Navy? Okay, there's one flag man knows. You hold it up, John? You had to look close, but there's a plaque on it. It's a commissioning pennant. It stayed with the ship as long as it was in commission, and then they retired it, the commissioning pennant came down. Now, they were replaced as they were damaged, or if you're on a steamship, you know you boil blow boiler tubes every night at midnight, and they kind of got dirty sometimes. But uh, uh, this is the commissioning pennant from the USS Hunterdon County. There was a ship named oh, after yeah. the county. It says on the back. It was, it was an LST. Now, I, I should have slides here, but I just didn't have, I just moved and I didn't have time for slides. I'm not this folks. Getting anywhere with this? I better turn it on. <laughs> that any better? Right. Oh. There we go. No? Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, if, if, if the LST is about a, maybe turn that noise, turn that knob to the left. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. An LST is a landing ship tank. They were a little longer than a football field. They had a minimum draft of 14 feet because if you've seen any World War II pictures like uh, of the D-Day, you saw, D -Day, saw these LSTs run right up on the beach. They were flat bottomed and they rode like hell in a hard sea because they were flat bottomed. But uh, they could carry uh, tanks, uh, the tanks, and they could carry artillery or they could carry a whole battalion of people. And there were over 1,200 of them built during World War II. 
in the Navy. And uh, for the US Navy, the British used them also. Uh, the USS Hunter County was commissioned in 1944 uh, as the LST-838. Didn't have the county name yet. Uh, it was built at Ambridge Yard, just north of Pittsburgh on the Ohio River. They went down the Mississippi and they were commissioned uh, about a month later uh, at New Orleans. And they were sent immediately out into the Pacific, went down through the canal and out across the Pacific carrying a load of sea beefs for the invasion of Okinawa. As they approached Okinawa, a, a, a fellow LST with them got hit and sunk and they picked up about 75 survivors from the wreck. And, and then further on, they were scraped by a Japanese plane and a couple bombs hit close aboard. And they didn't sink, but they were damaged and they lost three or four people. Uh, Okinawa was a tough campaign. There were more sailors killed than there were Marines on Okinawa. And Okinawa was one of the worst land battles we had during the war, far worse than anything in Europe. But anyway, uh, it served an honorable career, and then at the end of the war, it came back and brought another load of, uh, I think, something like a regiment of soldiers, brought them back to San Francisco, unloaded, and then would put mothballs for 20 years because we didn't need them. Uh, 18, in 1966, uh, the Vietnamese War was uh, warming up, and four LSTs were picked, and one of them, uh, was the LST-838. It was reconditioned and recommissioned as the USS Hunter County. And there was a lady present in the commissioning ceremony from Hunter County. She was the daughter of one of the staffers of the Hunter County Democrat. And that's, I guess, how she got the contact. But anyway, they gave her the old commissioning pennant because it was when it was recommissioned, you got a new commissioning pennant and it, to bring back to the county. Uh, it, it served a distinguished record in Vietnam. Of these four, they were reconditioned, they, their superstructure was added on, and they increased the crew about by about 20 people to 120, uh, just for the increased complexity of the duties it was assigned. Uh, it did have some guns. There was one three-inch 50, there were four, uh, four twin 40s and some 20 millimeter. Uh, you know, three-inch 50 is a pretty, Potent weapon uh, has a shell about like that, and 40 millimeter is smaller, but about an inch and a half. And uh, they did sink uh, an ammunition, uh, Viet, Viet Cong <coughs> ammunition barge, blew up uh, in front of them uh, when they hit it with their 40 millimeters. Anyway, its primary duty was to support the river boats uh, in the Delta uh, with the most dangerous work during the war, the CBs and the uh, uh, river boats had the highest casualties in the Navy. Uh, so many were lost. I had a friend who was, was mangled for life and still had a steel piece in his skull that he was, he was on board one of these swift boats. <coughs> anyway, it served through the war and when Nixon invaded Cambodia, she was the first major U.S. ship to be across over the borders into Cambodia served out through the rest of the war. And finally it was leased to Thailand and ultimately sold to them and it disappeared from the Navy record. But it was a distinguished uh, ship. It had the presidential unit, <coughs> citation, and a several other citations for the work she'd done. And it's now a piece of history and we have her first commissioning pen. We did have a patch. Uh, now these weren't very fast ships. Uh, they had twin diesels. I never was on a diesel ship. All the ships I was on were steamers. And uh, uh, she could make about 11 knots, about as fast as it could go. 11 knots is about 12 and a half miles an hour maybe. But you can't get to, I was on a ship, the best we could do was 15 knots. And we left the Panama Canal headed for New Zealand. It took us three weeks from hitting the Panama to New Zealand and just underway constantly, and she's not very fast, but she had a, a 
we had a patch somewhere, we haven't been able to locate it, but on the patch was Festina Lente. Now, I was very poor in Latin in high school. I hated languages. But it means make haste slowly. So that was a story. <laughs> now, to shift pace a little bit, another of my favorite articles, and I'll. Here, John, I'll, I'll help you with it. It's on the end there. It's a poster war in Surgeonsville. Now, I'll caveat here, I'll let you know this is a pre production uh, that I have home, but we have the original hanging in the or it was in the library of the Doric House. Uh, some of these things were on exhibit here at the library, and I don't know whether they ever got back there or not yet, but uh, in 1856, the militia in Hunter County was uh, being reformed and, and, uh, and, and reinvigorated, uh, and Surgeonsville and Lambertville were the two towns who seemed to have the biggest militia involvement. In 1856, this unit was formed in Surgeonsville. There was a militia unit. There were maybe 35, 40 people. Supposed to be 40, but often there were not. Now, what next, John? Uh, well, okay, the flags. These are three flags in our collection. Now, these are full-size flags, and they're beautiful, and they're fragile. Civil War flags were silk. The rebel flags were made out of cotton because they had lots of cotton and no silk. So they tend to be more rugged and last a whole lot longer. But these are in our collection, and uh, uh, the, top, the top one is the flag from Surgeonsville, which was issued, according to the Democrat, in 1856. The second one is a flag from the Baptist Town Cavalry, uh, and issued, I think, 1861. And the bottom one is from Old Wick, uh, 4th Cavalry, 4th Division of 100 County Militia. It'd be nice to have them here, but they're too fragile and too, too bulky to handle. The militia was quite active here in Civil War times. And here are a couple of militia swords this is uh, a sword from Captain Samuel K. Everett in the Cherryville, or, yeah, Cherryville Guards. Uh, now, he was never in Civil War service, but he was a captain in the militia. Probably he was too old for Civil War service. Not that you could be too old, but he didn't have to join, and he didn't. There was no record of him ever having uh, served during the war. It has a nice brass scabbard with it and a beautiful bluing blade. Bluing is unusual on the blades of the time. Usually they were either bright or browned. Browning was another process. The second sword, now this is militia. You can see it's a lighter blade. The second sword is an infantry officer's sword. This one was used uh, by captains of infantry uh, to lead their troops. You can see it's a much heavier blade. This one belonged to George uh, Hewley, and he was uh, he was a, an officer in the pre. You can look at these things later in the pre-Civil War militia, and he served as a sergeant. Uh, Andrew Little, excuse me, Andrew Little. He served as a sergeant of the Ninth New Jersey. He lasted through the war, came home. He lived right around the corner from where I used to live in Pittstown. And uh, in early July, he shot himself through the heart with a pistol. No one knows why. Um, post, you know, post-war syndrome, maybe. It wasn't recognized then, but it is now, of course. One more Civil War item. If, if people have looked at this, and if you can look later, it, it's a soldier's staple, hardtack. Our tech is nothing but flour and water, sometimes a little salt. It's harder than hell. I used to make it hand it out at lectures, but it's hard on tea. <laughs> Soldiers used to take it and pound it with a rifle butts and then boil it in their coffee, and that's how they ate it, called it schmoosh or schmoosh or something. But it's rare to find it. It usually came in a square, uh, about two-inch square form, but this is broken. 
probably made the middle. Sometimes there were ship's biscuits when they didn't have enough, and they were big and round, but they broke up. And that may be what this is from. After the war, there were GAR folks. The GAR was the Grand Army Republic. It was the veterans organization, the main veterans organization of the Civil War. And this is a beautiful little flag from Post 20, which was Lambertville uh, GAR post. And we have a number of articles in our collection that uh, were Civil War relics that were collected by the Post 20 and passed on to us ultimately when it went out, it went out of business. Uh, this one? The, the Shakos there. Oh, okay. Well, well, that, well okay, well, you can take that one. Okay. We have probably, I don't know how many were the richer, maybe 40 grains of flag fragments. Now, flag fragments are hot items in Civil War today. These were, a, a Civil War regiment used up a flag a year, you know, just from the weather and battle damage because they were silk. They didn't last that long either. And we, and so there are fragments, fragments around. Uh, I'm a member of the New Jersey Civil War Heritage Association. Twice a year, we have five different flags on exhibit. We rotate them because there are 160 flags in the collection. And we only have five. The, the cases cost $20,000 each just to put them on display. And there's 10 flags in each case. Bring a different one to the top. But uh, these are battle flag flags of the 15th, which was formed here in, on the fairgrounds, or right adjacent to the fairgrounds where uh, Costco is now. It's the Joe Boss Farm right next to the fairgrounds, and they spilled over onto the fairgrounds to use the buildings because they didn't have enough tents yet. The 15th went on, it was one, one quarter of the regiment was two and a half companies was from Hunter. The rest were from the north, rest of Northwest New Jersey. They had, there were only 11 regiments in the whole, out of over 2,000 who had more battle casualties than the 15th. In one battle alone in Spotsylvania, they lost 312 out of 449 men. So it was, you're right chances of surviving were so good. Many regiments went to war and were never in combat, but that's you know just the luck of the draw. And we kind of skipped over the period a little bit, the two Shakos there. The one Shako you can see is, uh, well, this is from the Surgeonsville Guard, Delaware Guard, the same unit as that. See the Delaware Guards on that poster. These were worn by the militia, and this is from the Baptist Town Cavalry. He, the C is missing. These are these are these are fragile, and uh, we're lucky to have them. Were those parade hats or what, John? Militia. Well, they did. You know, the militia was. Every, by law, if you anybody between 18 and 45 had to belong to the militia, but then there was the active and there was the inactive. The actives were the ones who got the uniforms and the weapons. Uh, Samuel Everett, whose sword this was, put an application into Trenton, and he was issued 40 muskets and a set of accoutrements. Uh, it doesn't specify; it just says rifle percussion which means nothing, there's so many possibilities, you're not quite sure what kind of guns they were, but uh, and these, these membership constantly changed in these militia outfits because people joined the army and went off and so then they were replaced. At the end of the war, half the units didn't give their guns back, so. that covered the Civil War items. Telephones. I remember this type. I never remembered this type, but uh, we had a party line of three bridges. Uh, were four of us on the line, but ours were 213J was our number of four rings 
on the same line was my dad's bead mill, which was two rings, and my uncle, who was his partner, three rings. And so it was a party line. But fortunately, nobody outside the family, but the regular party line, you picked it up and you got an operator and you told them who you wanted and they would connect you. And you've seen pictures of them putting in plugs in the switchboards. It's a far cry from today. We're spoiled with these damn machines. Well, well. Dialing systems didn't come to Plumington until I think it was 1956. Now, now, and, and that was an amazing advancement. You didn't need an operator, you just dialed and connected with whatever number you dialed, hopefully. This is apparently an older one, it, uh, but this has a patent date of 1907 on it, this one. I'm not a telephone expert. I know a little bit about agriculture, that's where I spent my life. This is a model of the Kugler corn plow. Uh, I don't know if people, they use chemicals, they don't cultivate corn anymore. But when I had a garden, whenever I cultivated, everything looked better. Somehow you got air into the roots or something, I don't know, or at least moisture was more easily put down into the roots. But you plowed your corn because you didn't have the chemicals like Roundup uh, today. And uh, I had no qualms about using Roundup all around the subject. If Roundup was killed, you're like the chemicals say, uh, I'd be dead long ago. We should take baths and stuff. It doesn't bother any of us. John, they have scientifically proved that Roundup is not responsible for, for all of those lawsuits that people. Yeah, but we, yeah, how many billion dollars later? It cost the company and it cost, right. actually cost the farmers and it cost the consumers more. Like I say, we used to, you know, it has an LSD 50 rate, if that means anything to you, of less than table salt even, or table sugar, excuse me. Mm -hmm. So it was just a bum rap. If lawyers got into this action, yeah. the lawyers were the ones that made all the money. Yeah. But uh, this was an amazing venture, invented by a man who had a farm at Rockefeller's Mills in Redding, on the Reddington Township side, named Oliver Kugler. The farm buildings are all gone now, but uh, it's just on the old road from Plumington to Three Bridges on the Reddington Township side of the Rockefeller's Mills. It's very simple. He patented it, I think, 1874. It's made out mostly of wood, so you can make it yourself. And about the only metal parts were the shoes for tokering, which could be set either to plow away from the fur or in towards the borough. And they were used, they were a sensation of the age, according to the Democrats, and the ad in the paper. And he traveled all over the country protecting his patents. And in the end, he didn't make anybody any money on it because he spent all this money on travel trying to protect his patents. But uh, he, he uh, walked around in three bridges and he owned the property that ultimately where my dad had the feed mill there behind the hotel in Three Bridges. John, can I put in a plug for Oakham Jemison and say- Go ahead, oh yeah, okay. Oakham Jemison Farmstead Museum down uh, as you cross the, the uh, river on the, on the bridge above uh, Lambertville, look over to the left and you'll see red farm buildings. We have uh, full size versions of a lot of the uh, patent models that were made here in this yep. county. And Pittstown was a prime place for it with Deets and the Deets Plow, and, and Deets certainly had a big part to play with the Hunter County Historical Society and also with what we have in the collection down at Oakland Jemison. And if you've never been down there to see some of the large scale, you should. full scale models, uh, please come, come sometime. Well, years ago, now it must have been 20, 25 years ago when the Rutgers Patent yeah. Museum shut down, Frank Barlow, who was then president of the yeah. Oakham Jimison, and I went down there. And all this stuff was slated to go to some museum in Monmouth County. And we persuaded them. When we got the Deeds Corn Plow that you had, the Red Mill has another one, by the yeah. way. On the, it used to be on the second floor of the mill. I don't know where it still is or not. But 
And we also got an almost unused number six deep plow. Yeah. Plus a little tractor cultivator, an orange one. I don't remember the details. I've never seen one like it before. So we did save a few items. And it is a great display down there. If you're ever have, half interested in agriculture or anything about early hunting, that's the place to go. It costs a lot of money to maintain those collections and buildings. They need money just like the society does. Sure. <laughs> when we talked about this uh, sword, uh, this is his picture. Uh, it's an amber type, which is a glass negative with uh, 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 black backing. Uh, most everybody calls these daguerreotypes. They're not, and they aren't tin types either. They're amber types. They were in use mostly before the Civil War. The CDBs came along with heart disease about 1860, 61, and most Civil War pictures are card disease, which is nothing more than a printed paper with a cardboard backing. Can't talk about what's upstairs in a, in a society building without newspapers. I've been sorting those papers for 60 years and I'm not done yet. But we have virtually every paper ever printed in Hunter County, with the exception of some of the Clinton Civil War papers. I don't know why we're missing those, but we are. But, uh, this is, here are two examples of the Hunter Gazette, which was the county's first paper, which was printed first in 1825. And it lasted up until 1866 when it merged with the Democrat and became the Democrat. And there, incidentally, were two different Hunter County Democrats publishing in Flemington for one year at the same time. And we have a complete edition of both of them. So also with a Daily Republican, which was a Republican paper, uh, which we also have every issue of. And some great newspapers. and. Here's just a sample of the towns that we have newspapers for. I would think that the Democrat lasted and the Republican didn't. Well, <laughs> it's a complicated political picture. Uh, during the Civil War, the Democrats were the conservatives and the Republicans were the radicals. And somehow, by the time we got to World War II, things had switched. Uh, You know, you, everybody that ran for office was a Democrat then. You didn't get elected as a Republican. Same way here, more Wasn't recently. Was Lincoln a Republican? What's that? Lincoln was a Republican. He was, but New Jersey voted against him in both elections, and we were the only non-border state to vote, vote him down in both presidential elections because we were Democrats here. He was a radical. Well, that's the truth. <laughs> Does anybody know what this is? I think it's rather obvious, but this section, yes, this section of water pipe. Now, Flemington was, I don't know when it was formed. I know they, the, the Fleming Castle was 1856, I think. Uh, or 1756, excuse me. But in 1880, Flemington formed a water company. And they laid these logs, and I don't know how they joined them. I have never figured that out. But uh, the source was up on Thatcher's Hill. They were spring fed, according to an article in the 1884 Hunter County Democrat. Uh, and they lasted for years, and I'm not enough of, I don't know what kind of wood this was, but I metal detected for years down in Virginia, and the wood that lasted most was chestnut. Now, I don't know whether that's chestnut or not. There were used to be a lot of chestnuts, and of course, the disease killed them all here. Except I have two home in Pittstown of the old chestnuts. You always try to get them before the worms did, but you know, 
I, I tried ShopRite buying them there and they were full of worms as mine. So you ate them at night at the campfire and they didn't see the worms. Who knows what this is? Anybody have them in their house? We had it in our house in Three Bridges. The house was built in 1897, one of the wealthier men in town. Wash point. What's that? A wash point. No. Shutters? It's a shutter closer. You can open and close your shutters. Those were the days when shutters fit. Nowadays, they're just ornamental. But you, you had a crank on, and you crank them here, and they open it up, and so on. This was made by a Flemington company named Mallory. And they're still in business selling related items. But nobody uses opening or closing shutter inf instruments anymore. But it's rather unique, and of course it was, you know, this is a model. You use a full size shutter. And Only the wealthy them. people had them. Well, <laughs> we weren't wealthy. We bought the house, and my dad did, I did. But uh, it was a night, it was a great house. It was built, and like you don't build houses like that anymore. Yeah, buffers pantry and all inlaid floors. Did he do all the work himself? Say again? Did he do all the work himself? No, no, no. He was running the feed mill. He didn't have time. He just hired a gun. He kept, he kept the, Al McCarthy was our chief carpenter. I don't know if anybody remembers him. He lived in Centerville. But uh, the wallpapers and everything else, it took a long time to redo that house. During the Civil War, people hoarded metal coinage, and it became very scarce. So the government issued, and also private merchants issued tokens and script for paper, and they run from different amounts. You can see five cents, 10 cents, a quarter, and so on up. This is a set of fractional currency and some colonial currency, or some colonial type currency, shillings, that we have in the society. We have a lot more in the, in the vaults, but uh, it's very unique. They didn't last long, and uh, people didn't have any confidence in them, so they preferred coins. And it's and a great display. Are, huh? The vault's also an antique. What is that? Our vault's also an antique. Yes, it is. <laughs> well, we have a saying, but it's a big, heavy one. Mr. Deeds, came from Mr. Deeds, out of, out of the Deeds building. We can get it open some of the time. <laughs> <laughs> and you're the only one that can do it. Too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's got those fingers. <laughs> Sometimes you can make great stories out of seemingly insignificant items. Now, here's a couple of rocks. I was hoping John Allen would be here today. He's a geologist. I have no idea what kind of rocks these were. But whatever they are, West Portal has a million of them. You know, everybody here know where West Portal is? Somebody doesn't? Okay, well, it's on the out western side or northwestern side of Jotown Mountain. It's come down off the hill on Old 22. A lot of people are using that today because they're blasting on the 78 and they shut down the highway sometimes so you go the old way. Well, right at the bottom of the hill is West Portal and I had a little feed store there for 10 years where we operated our mobile grinders. Go out on the farm and grind their grain and add our uh, ingredients. And so I was the only business in West Portal that was not a thriving enterprise at the time. At the Time the railroad went through, railroad Lehigh Valley went through, once they completed the tunnel from Pattonburg to West Portal, which was about a mile long and one of the longest tunnels at the time it was built east of the Mississippi. And it was a major undertaking. And it was open for years and finally the trains got too big and so they bored another one for the bigger trains. And more recently, while I was still there in my office at uh, Bloomsbury at the fertilizer plant, uh, they excavated underneath the tracks so they could run them trains at two feet higher so they could lose double deckers and all the things were cargo containers double decked i don't know how many million dollars that must have cost the railroad company but it paid them in the long run the lehigh valley went through the tunnel rather than the central which went through high bridge and up around the north uh, to avoid the grades but 
it saved them a lot of mileage and uh, a lot of money and ultimately but anyway I set the look yes I got a question that bridge that's there in Bloomsbury that got hit by a trucker is that off his bearings is that considered to be property of the railroad company who the, the bridge in Bloomsbury that goes over the tracks that was a railroad bridge, yeah. That, well, my, I sat there for years and watched these tractor trailers go over there. I'm almost afraid to put my car on that. There was nothing under that bridge in the way of support. No. And I often wondered I would come to work one morning, some morning, and find a tractor trailer down on the tracks. Yeah. Now it's shut, you can't yeah. use it at all. And I guess they're arguing over who has to replace it. That's what I was wondering, because I usually go that way yeah. to, from Pittstown to Bloomsbury, and it's like. Well, there is another bridge. If you come down off the hill, make before you cross this bridge, make a left, but it's a winding, twisting road to get back to Bloomsbury once you cross yeah. over the railroad. Yeah. But yeah. you can go that way, but not heavy trucks. We never used it in our trucks because you know our trucks weighed 11 tons empty, and we would have 16, 17 tons of lime on them. So that's a lot of weight. And well, that's, I guess they'll battle it out. But anyway, we're back to our rocks here. <laughs> in 1897 now that seems like a long time ago but of course about when my dad was born and so to me that's a little more recent well i was born in 1934 so i'm getting there too if i can pass another six months i'll be 90 or so uh but anyway in 1897 a promoter stepped off the railroad at west portal and then had Lehigh Valley had passenger trains then, uh, like now it's freight only. And it was Conrail for a while, and now it's Norfolk Southern. Uh, but it's a busy freight road because it runs direct from the Newark Container Piers all the way to Buffalo and further west. But a lot of trains, sometimes every 20 minutes, 100 car trains. And I used to lay awake, you could hear them at night going by, but now I can't hear them, and I'm living in high bridge. But the little toots of those passenger <coughs> trains and high bridge don't compare. But anyway, this guy stepped off the train and he, uh, he, he rented a room in the hotel. The hotel is still standing there uh, where the road branches off to Asbury. We know where it is at the bottom of the hill. It's on a little extra loop off the road. But, uh, he announced that he was a member of a syndicate who was interested in starting up a business there in West Portal. And he, uh, he selected the land which is just west of the hotel. You know where the little building that the West Portal Historical Society operates? It was just kind of behind, and to the, behind that and off towards the west a little. And he rented it from the owner for hundred dollars a month which was a lot of money at the time the, the, the area was very financially poor at the time and remember we went through the panic of 1893 and then there was a recession which followed and nobody had any money the farmers didn't have any money the, the workers we didn't have that many workers but all of a sudden this guy rented this place and out from New York he brought at first 190 Italian laborers and he offered them a dollar fifty up to a dollar seventy-five a day, which was about fifty percent more than what Edison in his cement plant, which was right across the river in Warren County, uh, paid his workers. And but in order to get these jobs and this high pay, they had to pay the promoter five or six dollars each. And if you were a foreman, you had to pay them up to ten dollars. Anyway, these hundred and ninety people came and he engaged some brewery in Easton, could have been sites, I don't know which one, uh, to supply beer for them. Uh, and he set up a bakery of baking out 100 loaves of bread a day, and ultimately more, and he, and he bought bread from the, everything was on credit. He didn't pay a nickel to anybody or anything. Uh, he got to deal with the uh, lumber yard in Hampton, which is not that far away, uh, for lumber, again, on credit. And then he started to work. Well, you know, a week, a month went on, and they started to build this wall. It was a drywall, no cement, no mortar. And you can do it. My sister did it by herself down at her house in Kingwood Township. She had great drywalls. Anyway, it was 
four to five feet thick at the bottom and was eight feet high. Nobody ever figured out the purpose of the wall, except perhaps it was to shield vision from what was going on inside, which was nothing. <laughs> it was a large area covered, and uh, they worked for two months. They hired local farmers. If I think for a dollar and a half a day, you could get a horse and a, and a man to haul the rocks and stone that they needed to haul for the wall. Now, you didn't have to go far because if West Portland is very rich in rocks, and it's heavily ironed. Uh, most people don't know that you think of iron in Hunter County and you think Taylor Wharton and <coughs> which was far more ore published and produced out of the uh, West Portland area than ever was in Highbridge. Uh, Highbridge processed it, but they didn't process it. They just dug it out of, and shipped it off. A lot of it came down by way of tramway from the mountain on top of Jugtown. There's a mine, it's a county park now, it's just opposite the Bethlehem Township buildings, if you know where they are on Mine Road. But anyway, came down this causeway and, and to the railroad, and it was hauled off by the railroad. But uh, it went on a week, I mean a month, six weeks, and nobody was getting paid, and they were getting awful anxious. Uh, you know, the, these promoters, they had, they built a big bunkhouse, 150 feet long, uh, and they were planning another one 450 feet long, but that's a big building, 550. Uh, but they never built it. But uh, they got commitments from local hardware stores for shovels and wheelbarrows and picks and so on. Never paid, again, all on credit. And after six weeks, nobody was getting any wages, so everybody was getting anxious, and they were ready to revolt. And the, the promoter said, well, we're going to Washington, D.C. This was in September. We're going to get some money to pay all you folks. Well, they left and never came back. <laughs> Everybody was left holding the bag. Nobody got any money, and the people who had, the, the hardware merchants got nothing, and the beer people got nothing, and the bread people got nothing, and neither did the laborers. And so that was the story of the great West Portal hoax. Apparently they made their money by charging the workers five dollars a piece, and there were ultimately over a thousand workers. I mean, it was, it was a big time game. It was going on there. What what happened to the wall? Okay, well, here's part of it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. You would never remember my little feed store. It was an ancient bit of. Uh, uh, we just had a couple of mobile grinders, and we worked out of there. And I lived on the ingredients. That was we would grind the farmer's grain and mix in ingredients. And it was on the opposite side of the highway, looking down over where this wall used to be. Now, have any of you ever eaten at the sandstone, the restaurant that was there? I was there once, I didn't care for it. But anyway. Too loud. Too, was that? Too loud. Well, I was there the first time it burned. It was uh, a couple of days after Christmas colder than hell, there was a heavy wind, maybe 20 miles, 30 miles an hour, and, and below, almost zero. And that's unusual for around here, and the firemen were having a hell of a time. And, you know, the hoses froze up, and they, the wind was whipping these flames, and it just, they lost, they couldn't contain the building. Well, I, I had the only oasis in West Portal. I had three or four bottles of whiskey left over from what I had to give out to patrons at Christmas. And the firemen came and they warmed, I had a little kerosene stove, and they warmed up and they all got a shot or two of whiskey. <laughs> so I was their savior for that one. Uh, so then the sandstone opened and then operated for maybe 10 years and then there was another mysterious fire. Uh, and now today, it's rebuilt, I guess. I haven't been up there, but uh, you go online and apparently the restaurant is not open, but it's advertised as a uh, an event location. If you want to pull on a rock star or somebody, I don't know if they had anybody scheduled, but it was advertised that they could do that. But what had happened to it after the wall was built? It sat there for a number of 20, 30 years, and. Uh, Anyway, it was, uh, they built a swimming pool there. It was a huge swimming pool. Supposedly, it was one of the 
largest in the east at the time it was built. It was called Van's Swimming Pool. And I think if you have the book, One Town Around, which has local pictures in it of West Portal and all around the West Portal area, uh, that was published maybe 30, 40 years ago. Uh, there's a picture of it in there, I think. And, and later, in the 1940s, Jerry Colonna, everybody remember Jerry? He was a famous showman. His brother operated, uh, he built a restaurant and a casino and things there. And he operated that for a number of years until he had too many of his own drinks, came down the hill and smacked into something and that was the end of him. <laughs> but, uh, then it sat empty for a while, and uh, finally the, the swimming pool though was open, and, but and the problem was it was spring-fed from up on the mountain, and the water was colder than hell, <laughs> and it was a little too cold for most people. But, and then it just laid empty for a while. But it was later, uh, in the 40s, Kelowna operated as a Miramar, if that's the name familiar to any of you. It was a big pool. Uh, I don't know, several hundred feet long by several hundred feet. Uh, I don't know if you look it up, what you might see on Google, but you can try. But uh, eventually it closed and then it just sat there until sandstone came along after the fire. And that's the story of one of the greatest hoaxes of Hunter County. A lot of flim flam. Now there is today. Well, I didn't know we were going to get through this, but I guess we covered most everything. Is there any questions? Or, again, if you're interested in more detail, go to the Historical Society, ask Pam, the librarian, for the computer index, and she can tune you into where to find them. They're all in one big four kernel, four uh, anyway, there's four drawers, and it's a lateral cabinet there in the library. Thank you. Do you have any questions for John on all this cool stuff? Well, yeah, I, I, to me this is more valuable. I'm more interesting than all that paper stuff we have downstairs. Admittedly, it's more valuable. All those presidents' signatures and famous people, Patrick Henry included. Uh, we keep finding things as we do. We, we just put on a little more labor and it's going to cost us a lot of money. But we, <laughs> <laughs> well, we think it's well worth it. And, We're cheap. Uh, we're actually getting our files in order. Now, stuff keeps coming in as fast as we can process it, so don't expect miracles. Mm -hmm. well, we wanted to do this lecture today because most of these items just didn't fit into anything else we were talking about. And the, the uh, Historical Society does own a tremendous amount of very cool stuff, um, some of which is too big to bring here or too fragile. Well, regretfully, most of this stuff never sees the light of day because we're a document society. That's on display. Yeah. Did the Baptist Town Cavalry actually serve in the war? No. None of the militia units ever served in the whole state of New Jersey. They were strictly local militia. Now, in some cases, almost every man in those militia companies enlisted and went on to serve in other units, but not as uh, as the organization of their own militia company. Any other questions? So, every, hang on one second, one second Dave. I, I just wanted to say that before I forget, everything up here, please take a look at and don't touch. Some of it's fragile. The swords are actually really sharp. They're dangerous. So. Um, you know, like I said, well, they aren't really too <laughs> sharp, but please don't touch the blade, that's all. Right, it's so a beautiful yeah. blue blade on this uh, militia sword up front. So, uh, go ahead, Jason. There's an item there from the Vigilance Society. I'm not sure if you oh, want to discuss. Oh, I mentioned that one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the county had, <coughs> there were no state police until 1820s. 1920s, right? Uh, 1920s, I've got mixed up. And there was no protection out in the country. Well, still, uh, I lived in Union Township 62 years until a couple months ago. We had no, we only have state police, is all anyway there. But the militia societies were local people who gathered together and formed a sort of cooperative. They would hire some minimum form of security, they would 
guarantee you a certain amount of dollars for your loss, and it was all by mutual subscription. You joined the society, you had to put in some money <coughs> and help protect you. It was sort of a rudimentary insurance company. Mm -hmm. And they were very popular, and here is uh, just one. I, I have home two huge notebooks of clippings of nothing but these militia companies. Mm -hmm. And they operated for years, and it's indexed by town, and you can look them all up. It's in the society now, I think. He's donating stuff, and I kind of forget what what I gave him. But pretty soon you get it all. Well, that was really the who's who of Flemington. Yeah. Before yeah. it was incorporated and where it catches. It kind of ended in the 1920s, when the, uh, about the time of the meeting trial, which was another great story of Hunter County. We did that once. We're, get, we're getting to that. We're going to hopefully bring that one back. Uh, what, okay. What's the progress? Uh, so we're, we're actually trying to do a documentary on this. Uh, it's expensive, really very expensive. Very expensive to do a documentary. The, the, the folks that uh, produced or directed the, um, the documentary on Rand Valley Reservoir, the town that disappeared overnight, are actually partnering with us to put this together. But it's expensive and um, it's really hard to get people to talk about the state police in a historical way. Um, <laughs> And this, uh, it was an event that happened up in, Jug in, uh, sorry, in Jutland. And, um, right involved, next to the town hall. It involved the, uh, the, AS the, the newly formed ASPCA, which had police powers, and had police powers up until 2011, when it finally got destroyed and blown up by the state legislature, long overdue. Um, they had raided a number of houses in Hunterdon over the century, causing heart attacks, um, illegal trespass, and nobody oversaw the ASPCA. Nobody, not the Attorney General, not local prosecutors, not county prosecutors. Um, when I was in the legislature, I tried to blow them up unsuccessfully, and it finally, it finally did happen about uh, 10 years ago. Um, so um, we were, they, uh, there was a, uh, a he said, she said complaint launched, the ASPCA came, um, the V, the farmers, you know, basically said, get off my property, but they were armed, and they came back with the newly formed state police, which had no real rules at all. And uh, there was a shoot em up on the farm, and one of the brothers got shot, and um, the sister got killed. And the state police were brought to trial in the Hunter County Courthouse. It was pre Lindbergh, it was the largest trial in the United States, it was over the fold. The only thing that knocked it off the newspapers, if you want to take a guess, was, Lit was Lindbergh crossing the Atlantic. That's what knocked it off the front page. Um, it's a very important story. Now, because of this, and the, and the police officer was found guilty, um, then Colonel Schwarzkopf uh, reorganized the state police. Completely, I mean, completely reorganized the state police to the point where uh, the, the um, there's a, a, a book. Every police station, state police station, has a book. I'm trying to think, it's like a log book. And the day you become an officer, you, you get signed there. You sign in, and then you sign. You know, you always sign into this book. And so this is a thing that when police officers retire, they go back and they want a copy of their log book from the date they signed in. So when Schwarzkopf reorganized the state police. The log books, the old log books were destroyed. They started all over again, literally, just like just like, where it's a new day, we're reorganizing. So it was a really a, a good thing for the state police because we haven't had horrible actions like that in New Jersey, like some of the other states have had with police brutality. Anyway, long story short, getting anybody to talk about the state police, very hard to get them. I mean, they'll talk about it off camera. Nobody wants to talk about it on camera very, very difficult. Uh, and I've approached governor, former governors. I've approached former uh, attorneys general. I've approached uh, former Supreme Court justices. Everybody thinks it's an interesting story. They've all read the book. They're all like, you know, this is an important story to talk about. It's very prescient. It's just what's going on today around the country. And making a documentary is hard, hard on this topic. So. You know, but it's like, it, like I said, it reorganized the whole state police, but it took a hundred years to fix the ASPCA. 
It's not the ASPCA, it's the SPCA, the NJSPCA. I don't want to confuse it with an actually good organization, the ASPCA. The NJSPCA, that was a mess. It was a mess, including their attack on T. Carlson, who owned the um, Animal Society in Holland Township, 90 years old, you know, husband's a millionaire, donating money, SPCA went in, et cetera, had her arrested, 90 years old, had her arrested and handcuffed. So it's bad news. They were very bad news. Can you so, see this stuff at the society, or did you see all the doc main documents? You can see that. Some of this stuff is on display at the Doric House on Main Street in Flemington. If you walk in, there are bookshelves on top of the shelves all the way around the building, or shelf space. Some of these items were from there. The rest is in the archives building. The fire marshals got out of it, got after so, it for having that stuff up there, but so far they haven't forced it. So the question was, can you visit the archives? The answer is uh, no, unless there's an event there. Uh, and if you want to see any of these things, uh, you'd have to go in and talk to Dave, who is the manager over there. He runs the show. Um, let him know what you want. They, they, by appointment, they can make arrangements for you to see stuff. But we aren't trying to be exclusive. It's just we don't have the manpower uh, to do this. The problem is if you don't know what you want, you don't know what they have. I mean, is there a card catalog where we have everything listed? We do have a number of things that are, are listed, a, a decent percentage online, not everything because we've been collecting since 1885, but we only started you know, putting everything onto the computer in like 2012, so we're, we're a little behind. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, we, can always, we can always make arrangements. We are in the process where we're gonna rotate some things in and out of the shelves on top of the library, so. Hopefully somebody comes one time, they'll see a number of things, they come back a little bit later on, there'll be some other new items. And there's a lot more over there. There's a whole oh, case yes. of medical yeah. equipment, there's a display case of pottery in China. And, and yeah. plus our Indian artifacts, which we have in uh, our the space public over library. the town library. Yeah. Yeah. Tremendous exhibit that's just been recently re reworked by archeologists and put in correct time periods. And one of the great things we have is one of the original wooden signposts for the Perryville Inn. It was done by one artist, I've forgotten, Bunnell maybe? Um, yes, by William Bunnell painted it's it. It's upstairs on the second floor yeah, of the archives. It's, yeah, it's, it's got wormholes in it. It's fragile. It's got a beautiful faded look that old stuff has. Yes, it has a portrait of Andrew, ja painted portrait yeah. of Andrew Jackson on one side and then a, I'm not, I forget what the other scene, there's a battle. It's named Perryville because it opened up in 1812 about the time of Perry had his victory on Lake Champlain or, yeah. yeah. Do you have any young people involved? That's our problem. <laughs> you know, that would be Everything's on the, we can't, anything's on the internet. We've got it all. Yeah. Well, all there. Mm -hmm. They don't. Uh, but. You yeah, should also know that the Hunter County Historical Society is not part of Hunter County government. It is a 501c3 yeah. private organization. Um, back where the refreshments are, they know you're going to go get a cookie. You could pick up a membership form. You could pick up a copy of their latest newsletter. Dues are only, are we holding them at 30? Yeah, them? seniors 20, 30 for me it. individual members, 50 for a family. $30, 50 for a family, 24 senior, <coughs> not a lot. And you get more access and you get the newsletter. They have additional um, additional things happening, um, society. So. Um, the membership fees basically pay the day-to-day, -day, barely pay the day-to-day -day operations. Like I said, we're raising money all the time um, to support the archives building and taking care of all this, this stuff. And you know, hopefully, we'll, hopefully the historical study will bring, you know, this is a great Newsletters are great. Most of these items have articles about them written on, in the newsletter. A lot of the older ones you can find online on our website. Um, we go back to when we started, I think, in 1965. So you can find some of the newsletters and just read through them. And you'll see their PDF, so you'll see, like, you'll read the actual newsletter with the photos and everything in there. Um, and then, you know, if, if you, you know, if you don't mind me saying, if you do become a member, you know, you, you do get the newsletter. There's discounts on, on programming. And for people that come into the library to use the facilities to research or something like that, we don't charge a fee if you're a member. If you're a non-member, we charge ten dollars a visit. So, Pays for itself. Anything? Any other questions? 
So there are cookies and lemonade in the back, and our sales table is open. Please look and touch. Thank you so much for coming. We hope you'll come back next Sunday for our last lecture on the medical subject at the Society. And the parade.